Welcome everybody to Go Local Live. I'm Josh Fenton, CEO and co-founder. Enjoy this beautiful day. It is spectacular. A little news before we get started. Uh, first and foremost, if you haven't seen the story, uh, City of Providence is putting up uh, speed humps all over the city. Uh, and folks are reacting to this new uh, effort to slow traffic. Many have commented, I thought the potholes were the effort to slow down traffic. But take a look at that story as well. A lot is breaking this morning. There are gonna be updates all day and this afternoon. I wanna go to Amy Nunn. She's with the Rhode Island Public Health Initiative. She's one of the people behind the effort to put a fee on sugary drinks. Uh, Amy, thanks so much for joining us. Delighted to be here, thank you. Okay, so here's this legislation. You've got it in the House and the Senate. It's got a, a, an important effort to try and impact childhood obesity, their health, nutrition, hunger. It's got a lot of components to it. Why don't you give us an overview of what this legislation does? So this is House Bill 5717 and Senate Bill 0327. What this bill does is introduces a sugary drinks tax of 1.5 cents per ounce on sugary beverages, not diet drinks. Um, and then the dollars and the proceeds from that would be reinvested in um, hunger alleviation efforts across the state of Rhode Island. And listen, you know, it's been well documented. We've written about it. National Press has written about it. The amount of hunger in the United States coming out of uh, or during this pandemic, uh, the amount of lack of nutrition during this pandemic, especially of children. Um, talk about why this is important now. Our hunger rates have now surpassed those of the Great Depression in the 19. Uh, late 1920s and 1930s. One in four Rhode Islanders is currently going hungry, and that um, is really cause for alarm. Um, right now, we have um, some of the highest rates in the country, and this is a real public health crisis. One challenge is that um, th this has been um, amplified by COVID. Uh, so many people have lost their jobs, Particular, particularly people in the service industry and the hospitality industry, the restaurant industry, and are now going hungry. Um, a lot of people are struggling to put food on the table and can't afford to, um, to eat healthy. Even people who want to eat healthy, who have good habits, are really struggling. Yeah, I mean, let's put this in some, in to some perspective. Rhode Island has the 11th highest childhood obesity rate in the country, I mean, we're there with like Mississippi. I always think any state ranking when you're, when you're near Mississippi is just not a good health or education moniker. Rhode Island 11th, Massachusetts is 41st. I mean, we're, we're miles behind Massachusetts on this issue. Yeah, those data are really alarming. I'm from the deep south, which also struggles a lot with obesity. I'm originally from Arkansas, so I do find those numbers to be particularly alarming. I think what they reflect are our are, are big challenges with racial disparities. We have a large um, Hispanic population in Rhode Island, and our children, our Hispanic children, fare 49th in the country for health and wellness outcomes. Um, and one of the biggest challenges for child health in the state, and particularly for Hispanic children, is obesity and diabetes. Um, and those are big, big problems here in Rhode Island. And I think that's what those numbers, um, that uh, number 11 ranking is reflecting, um, are big disparities. And listen, it's not just their problem, it's all our problems. These healthcare costs, when you get childhood obesity numbers like this, the long-term impact of healthcare costs for those children as they grow up, just grow and grow and grow on an order of magnitude that uh, begins to cost the taxpayer a ton of money. Talk about that, the economics of this legislation. I agree, it's really hard to reverse the impacts of childhood obesity after age eight, um, and that is because our bodies respond. So it's very important that we intervene early and that we intervene now. And you're absolutely right that we should not be penny wise and pound foolish. People who have food related chronic diseases are more likely to um, contribute to rising healthcare costs and they are expensive to take care of later. And that's why it's really important to intervene early. 
And these um, measures that we're proposing would go a long way to mitigate a lot of those problems. Uh, Amy, talk a little bit about the politics of this. You know, we're just coming out of the legislative break uh, for school vacation. This is where sort of the rubber hits the road up at the, the Rhode Island State House. Talk about what momentum you think you have going uh, to be able to push this through. You know, we think we have a lot of forward momentum. We've got a lot of um, different institutions and thought leaders who've signed on to this. And we're really optimistic and hopeful that the legislature continues to advance on these two bills. And give some examples of some of your partners in pushing this legislation. Well, we've been delighted to partner with the American Heart Association, both the local chapter as well as the um, national chapter, who has uh, both supported this effort um, over the last decade um, and also have pro generously provided support for this advocacy coalition. We've also been really pleased to partner with some of the health systems, the health equity zones, and a lot of other different nonprofit organizations around the state that are joining hands, um, joining forces with us on this important legislation. Amy, you're not fighting against uh, no one. You're fighting against powerful interests. Uh, the beverage industry in the United States, whether it's uh, the Coca-Cola or Pepsi, or some of the biggest corporations in the country, uh, they've got a huge vested interest in it. Certainly, they don't want to see this start become a momentum across the country. They want to stamp these efforts out state by state. Talk about what you expect to hear from them. Well, I expect I, I will put on my body armor. Let me say that first. Um, I know that they will come back and attack this initiative, but we will be always and forever in favor of advancing the health and wellness needs of Rhode Islanders and particularly for our children. I think that what the beverage industry does is engage in fear tactics about unemployment and um, taxation. But if you look really hard at the data on these things, I'm a scientist by training, and so I like to see the data. They really have very little data to support any of those claims. And by the way, one thing that the beverage industry is now doing is they're no longer refuting the fact that sugar is bad for you. They used to do that. Now they've come around on that. Even the CEO of Coke in the last few weeks acknowledged that they need to be making drinks with less sugar. Um, I think what they do now is really try to scare people about government overreach, about unemployment, about um, the detrimental impacts is of uh, detrimental impact of tax of tiny little taxes on middle class folks. All of those things are absolutely false. So I want to tell people that as you hear these messages, please know that they are not grounded in any scientific evidence base whatsoever. They are designed to scare people and um, to promote the beverage industry interests and not public health. So when you think about public health, you should really be thinking about the science and letting scientists like myself and other people that are involved in this initiative bring you the right data. The beverage industry should not be a source for scientific evidence about the health and wellness impacts of sugary drinks. It They're really does. It's in, really, their, in their bottom line. It really does look like a throwback to the battle with tobacco 20 years ago. Uh, first denying that nicotine uh, was uh, uh, a problem, whether or not smoking would cause cancer. I think everybody remembers all those CEOs uh, testifying before Congress. We've sort of seen it, seen this movie before. What's the difference now in being able to get this legislation potentially through versus the past? I think what we really need now is a groundswell of community support to get people to contact their legislators. You're absolutely right. You know, we about the parallels with the tobacco industry. There was a time where it was considered perfectly socially acceptable to smoke at work, at restaurants, and in bars. And it took 30 years to pass legislation and ordinances to roll back all of those things. And now we look back and think, how could we possibly have allowed for those things in public? And I think that with the sugary drinks bill, that we might actually have a big public health opportunity. And we'll look back and think, why did we allow the beverage industry to control our public health dialogue? We need to act in the interests of families and children around the state. There are 144,000 people on SNAP in Rhode Island, 47,000 of whom are children. This bill is really designed to improve their health and well-being and has the interests of children at heart. 
the beverage industry will not take care of families and children. They are only interested in their profits. And that's an important distinction between our coalition and the anti, anti-soda um, tax messages. You'll be hearing flood the airways from the beverage industry in coming weeks. I mean, you really, you, you glossed over that number. N- nearly 15% of Rhode Islanders are on SNAP food stamps. And, and a third of those are children. 5% of our state's population are children on SNAP. Absolutely, and that's the, that is the very population that this legislation is di- um, designed to benefit. And we really think that a lot of those folks' voices have been lost during the pandemic because they are struggling just to make ends meet. They are struggling to put food on the table. And it's really time for us to act um, on their behalf. Uh, Amy Nunn, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Stay tuned for more details on this and where you can voice your uh, opinion on this legislation. Uh, We'll have a full write-up on that later today. Also, everybody stay tuned. Dr. Michael Fine will join us at 1.30, the former director of health. Uh, The numbers are uh, in fluctuation, let's say, on COVID here in Rhode Island. There's some positive numbers and some not very positive numbers. And earlier today, I was on a Zoom with Indian officials, the leading journalist and Dr. Ja at Brown University, uh, uh, watching that. The, the tolls going on in India related to COVID are just astronomical, with an estimated 1 million new cases per day, uh, not what the government is uh, reporting of 300,000. And estimated deaths by those on the Zoom today is 15 to 20,000 deaths a day. And they don't see us, uh, don't see India turning the corner anytime soon. Just staggering numbers tied to COVID in India. Everybody stay safe. Please wear your mask. If you haven't gotten vaccinated, get up, get out, and go over to the convention center. You don't want to be on our wall of data of hospitalizations and deaths. It's just an unfortunate and avoidable situation. Let's all please stay healthy. Thanks, everybody.